We have new details on a shooting that left a passenger on a bus hurt. What led up to the shootout between two drivers that had the bus caught in their crosshairs. The pandemic has caused plenty of families to struggle. One community hit by financial struggles, military families. But there is help on the way. We have details still ahead. Live from KZ12. The news at noon starts right now. New at noon, San Antonio police searching for this person right now. According to SAPD, he's wanted in connection with an aggravated sexual assault case that happened back on October 15th. Police said the suspect is accused of approaching two juvenile females and sexually assaulting them. If you can help, you're asked to uh, help the uh, police department and identify this person. Police that you contact SVU detectives at 210 207 Two, three, one, three. A nerve wracking morning for people in an east side neighborhood. Just the latest episode in what they say has been ongoing trouble there. Someone shot a man overnight as he walked along the 100 block of West Drexel near Hackberry. Katrina Weber reports bullets also hit close to home for several people who live there. The scene seemed like a case of dangerous deja vu, according to San Antonio police and people who live here. Officers were called out for gunshots around 3.30 this morning in an area they say is familiar. In the 100 block of West Drexel, they found a 36-year-old man who had been shot in both legs while walking down the street with a friend. He was taken to a hospital. Police also found bullet holes in two homes and a car nearby, but no one else was hurt. As they collected shell casings at the scene later, they told us the shooter got away in a car. People here speaking off camera say they wish the problems would go away. According to police records, officers have been called out 21 times since June for gunshots or shootings, all centered around a bar at the corner of West Drexel and Hackberry. In all, they've had 73 calls here for problems including fights and disturbances. Police could not say for sure if this shooting is tied to that business. It seems police still have a lot that they have to learn about this shooting. They were not able to provide a description of the getaway car, nor do they know why it happened. Reporting from Public Safety Headquarters, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. And we have an update for you this noon. We've learned more about a shooting that caught a VIA bus in the crossfire. Police now say two drivers started firing bullets at each other after one of them accused the other of cutting him off. Officers say a driver pulled up to a red light on Martin Luther King Drive, and that's when another driver pulled up to him, making accusations about the traffic incident. Police tell us the first driver sped off, shooting as he tried to get away because officers say he feared for his life. The second driver also pulled out a gun and started firing. At least one of those bullets hit a VIA bus. Some of the shrapnel from hitting that bus hit a passenger on the bus. That person was treated at the scene. One of the shooters was detained. Officers are still looking for the second shooter. A decade after a man died, the search for his killer continues. Now police are offering a reward for crucial information that leads to an arrest. Police say that back in October of 2011, police found Jeff Freeman on Fredericksburg Road, not too far from I-10 and Woodlawn Avenue. Officers say that Freeman appeared to have just been assaulted. He was taken to the hospital and later died from blunt force injuries. His death ruled a homicide. If you know anything about the incident, you're being asked to call 210-224-STOP. Crime Stoppers may pay up to $5,000 for information leading to felony arrests in this case. The jury at Kyle Rittenhouse's trial is deliberating for a third day with a new defense request for a mistrial hanging over the politically and racially charged case. The mistrial motion was sparked by a jury request Wednesday to rewatch video in the case. Rittenhouse's attorneys say the defense received an interior copy of a key video from prosecutors. The judge has not ruled on the request. The National Guard and DPS coming up with some new tactics to stop illegal border crossings. They are lining the banks of the Rio Grande River with shipping containers. This happening in Eagle Pass, it's called Operation Steel Curtain. The goal is to deter migrants from crossing into the U.S. This is video of that operation from Governor Greg Abbott. And it's not the only big story on the border as communities adjust after the bridges connecting Laredo and Mexico fully open to anyone who is fully vaccinated and eligible to cross. We have team coverage coming up tonight at 5, 6 and 10 with the latest along the border. 
Relief coming to some CPS Energy and SAWS customers. The San Antonio City Council just approved a new assistance program. It will help low-income people who have been financially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic who now need help paying utility bills. CPS Energy will be allocating $20 million and SAWS will get $10 million. Each utility will administer the funds to eligible customers. You can apply in person at any walk-in center or community event, or you can apply online. Dreadmaker Moderna is asking the FDA for emergency use authorization to approve its COVID-19 booster vaccine for adults over 18 years old. In October, the agency authorized a Moderna booster dose for people aged 65 and older and certain other at-risk adults. Moderna's two-dose primary series vaccine is currently authorized for emergency use for people 18 and older in the U.S. The CDC advisors are set to meet Friday to discuss recommending booster doses of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine for all adults. The FDA is expected to decide on authorizing booster doses of that vaccine and possibly Moderna's vaccine as well ahead of Friday's CDC advisory meeting. Rising prices making basic needs like fuel and food more expensive for everyone. But one group struggling with this may come as a surprise. They are the families of people who are gainfully employed by the U.S. military. CNN's Oren Lieberman has that story. Go, go. Go, go, go. It was hard enough when Rachel Sabo's husband deployed during the pandemic. Harder still when she lost her job, pregnant with her now 11-month-old son. I think anyone who has never gone through this, they don't really know how difficult it is until they've actually had to go through it. Like so many other military families, Sabo found herself struggling financially. She turned to military food pantries at Fort Bragg, which helped make ends meet until she returned to work and her enlisted husband received a promotion. Everyone needs help at some point in their lives, so you might as well take advantage of it. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin announced Wednesday that more help is on its way. In addition to an increase in housing allowances in high-priced areas, active duty troops will get financial education and better access to financial resources. Our men and women in uniform and their families have enough to worry about. Basic necessities like food and housing shouldn't be among them. The steepest rise in inflation in decades has pushed the cost of food, fuel, and housing even higher, all during the COVID-19 pandemic. Unemployment amongst military spouses worsened and affordable child care for military families became harder to find. I think COVID really was, was, that, was that point. Like we, we saw an increase in um, the demand for food at most of our locations by as much as 400%. And again, I, I tie that back to spouse unemployment and child care. As many as 125,000 active duty service members struggle with food insecurity, according to Feeding America, a nonprofit that runs a national network of food pantries. Shannon Rosaden, director of the Military Family Advisory Network, says their food distribution events draw thousands of families across the country, especially in high priced areas. And they're going through and they're coming out relieved. You know, we've had families literally tell us, thank you so much. I didn't know what I was going to feed my kids tonight. As costs of basic staples keep rising, shoppers today are paying over 5% more for their groceries than just a year ago, which concerns advocates who worry that members of the military experiencing financial hardship for the first time may not seek the help they need. That was CNN's Oren Lieberman reporting. And it's not just military families feeling the effects of the pandemic. People all over the Alamo City finding themselves in need. The San Antonio Food Bank, one organization that has helped meet that need. Coming up at our next half hour, we are talking to the president and CEO of San Antonio's Food Bank about how this organization has fared so far this year, but also what it needs right now. Cold front moved through late last night. What that means for the rest of your Thursday and a look at the upcoming weekend forecast. And also coming up this half hour, another local college team has a huge game this weekend. Larry Ramirez is talking UIW football Saturday. Coming up. Our annual effort to get new shoes to those in need in our community is back. How you can take part after the break. Last year, our KSAC community event collected more than 2,000 pairs of shoes for kids who are in need. And this year, the annual Share the Shoes Drive is back. KSAC community teaming up with the San Antonio Police Department collecting new shoes that will benefit the local nonprofit Good Samaritan Community Services. Tiffany Huertas paid a visit to the nonprofit's facility and has more on the impact they're currently having on the community.
we start with our early childhood program and then it go, they graduate into La Escuelita and that prepares them for preschool. At Good Samaritan Community Services, they also provide youth and teen services. We were founded by the Episcopal Diocese of West Texas, and we have been serving our community for 70 years. Brandy Flores with the nonprofit says they provide different resources, meals, and programs for the West Side community. It's the most underserved zip code here in San Antonio. So providing resources that are otherwise unavailable uh, means everything, not only to Good Samaritan, that we're able to offer these resources but to our community. Here at the Senior Center they have arts and crafts, checkers, bingo and even do exercises. It's a perfect place for seniors to engage. I've been coming here about the 80s because of my parents. Aurora Gomez says she's made many friends along the way. It's never boring. We always have something to do. This holiday season, Flores says receiving the shoes from the annual KSAC Community Share the Shoes Drive means the world to this community. For us here at Good Sam, it's about seeing a child open Christmas gifts and one of those gifts being a pair of shoes. Tiffany Huertas, KSAC 12 News. Outside with live cam, we've gone from humid to dry, hot to cold or chilly and then uh, sure. calm to windy, all in less than 24 hours. It is blustery out there. Uh, yes, some big weather changes today. We'll get to enjoy some cooler, drier, more fall-like weather for another day or two after this, and then things turn right back around. But we've got another front in the plating forecast. We've got your Thanksgiving Day forecast to look forward to. So a lot to talk about in the weather department. And we'll get to that coming up in just a few minutes. First, the aqua for today is down just one tenth of a foot. And in your pollen count, molds are moderate with a count of 950. Juniper low with a count of 20. We'll be right back. Katie Blake is in for Justin Horn. He's out on a story, and he's probably having to hang on to his hat. Uh, yeah, I think so. Justin's not a big cold weather fan. Um, yeah, we know that. we got to turn the heat He's got no inside. body fat is his yeah. problem. We don't have that problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you guys know that, but for the viewers at home, Justin hates cold weather. Even like this today, he was like, man, it's going to be cold when I go out on my story. I'm like, Justin, it's not cold. Come on, man. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, think up. Little, I think it's a little refreshing. I love it. Yeah, nice. Uh, we're going to stay a bit cooler today and tomorrow, but things will turn around by the weekend, and we'll get to that forecast shortly. Here's the big picture. Front came through late last night while most of us were sleeping. A few showers uh, were squeezed out in and around San Antonio. Really not much rain to speak of, and we've got a little bit of shower activity south of town, and we'll take a look at that shortly. Temperatures behind this front here in our area in the 60s, also mid-60s up in Waco, but farther north we've got upper 50s from Dallas over to Abilene and then some 40s in the Panhandle, so it's not bone chilling cold. But as the northern tier of the state really clears out tonight as their winds relax a bit more, uh, the first freeze of the season is expected for a good portion of parts of the Concho Valley over to the Metroplex and then even into portions of southwestern Arkansas and northeastern Louisiana. So that's not for our area, but parts of Texas uh, are anticipating their first freeze of the season tonight. So no freeze here in South Central Texas, but we are getting closer to the time of year where we see our first freeze in and around San Antonio. That's typically um, as uh, we get to late November. I believe it's November 30th. Uh, elsewhere, the Hill Country, you have really passed your date for your average first freeze, and we have not had a widespread freeze across a portion of the Hill Country just yet. So we are a little behind schedule there ac across parts of the Hill Country. Uh, no freeze in the forecast though over the next seven to ten days. We do have some pretty chilly mornings. Our lows will be in the 40s Friday morning, Saturday morning, and look what happens though Saturday uh, as we get into as we get into Sunday morning. A big warm up there for our morning lows, mainly because of a quick increase or quick return in humidity that will take place over the course of the weekend. But then even looking ahead to early next week, behind yet another front, we'll see our morning lows fall back into the 40s by Tuesday. Look outside we have got a good amount of high cloud cover, so that high cloud cover does allow for some sunshine to kind of filter on through. It doesn't make things look too gloomy, but our sensor at the airport is reading mostly cloudy. There are those breezy north northeast winds and we're seeing gusts around 30 miles per hour for now, so it does look like our gusts have started to drop and we'll continue to see that trend as we head into the rest of the afternoon. Nonetheless, for the next few hours, some wind gusts up closer to 30 35 miles per hour can't be 
be rolled out, but generally for the rest of the day, especially after the sun goes down, wind gusts will really start to drop. Winds will relax a bit more, but it'll still be a touch breezy overnight. So here's a current look at satellite and radar. Again, we've got a good amount of cloud cover, especially south and west of San Antonio. And even with some leftover upper level energy, a few little showers and even a couple rumbles of thunder have developed south of Highway 90 from Pearsall down to Catula and then over to just west of Three Rivers. These are fairly short lived showers and they should continue to fizzle out as the afternoon goes on. I do expect we'll hang on to a good amount of this high cloud cover for the rest of the day overnight and into the start of the day on Friday. But by this time tomorrow afternoon, more of us should be looking at mostly sunny skies and that'll set us up for a pleasant end to the work week tomorrow. But for the rest of your day today, staying gusty at times through late this afternoon. For most of us, temperatures will be stuck in the 60s today. We'll also be in the 60s tomorrow. I do expect that it'll be a bit more comfortable with lighter winds and more sunshine this weekend getting warmer and then another front by Sunday, guys. I'm sure the football players are paying close attention to this. Yeah, they're going to love the cooler temperatures. Yeah, absolutely. Spurs would like to salvage this road trip they're on with at least one win out of this deal, wouldn't they? Yeah, they've lost the first two, and they've lost three in a row overall. So, you know, the Spurs want to close out the road trip tonight at Minnesota with a victory. And despite his early season struggles, Pop is sticking with Derek White and UTSA football is one day closer to their most important game of the season. Coming up. The Spurs will try to close out their three game road trip tonight at Minnesota with the win. So far, they're 0 for 2, losing at the Lakers Sunday night, 114 to 106, and the Clippers Tuesday, 106 to 92. Perhaps leaving the West Coast for Minneapolis will do them some good. A point guard, Derek White, is struggling a bit to start off this season. His points per game, field goal percentage, three point shooting, and free throw percentages are all down this season compared to last. But Pop is sticking with them, which means a lot to White. Yeah, it's been it's been huge. I mean, I mean it's pretty obvious, but um, just trying to fight through it. I mean, coach has been um, supportive, team has been real supportive. So um, just got to stay with it and, and know that it's going to come around. Spurs and Timberwolves will play tonight at seven. Spurs center Jakob Pertl is out because he's not in game shape. Minnesota hosting Sacramento last night. Third quarter, the ball goes to Carl Anthony Towns. He fakes a handoff, then backs his way down for a reverse baseline slam dunk for two of his 22 points. None fancier than those two. Fourth quarter, t -Bow's up two. D'Angelo Russell feeds a cutting Towns for another throwdown. Then with less than 30 seconds left in regulation, it's Patrick Beverly to cat for an exclamation point. T-Wolves win 107 to 97 and will host the Spurs tonight for their first back to back of the season. The Alamo Dome is the place to be this Saturday afternoon when UTSA will host UAB for the Conference USA West Crown. If the Roadrunners win, they'll clinch the Conference USA West Division for the first time in school history and then host the Conference USA Championship game on Friday, December 3rd. If they lose, they'll need help to get into the Conference Championship game. Now, they would have to beat North Texas in Denton, and UAB would have to lose to UTEP in their last game of the regular season. That's because the Roadrunners are 6-0 in conference games, while UAB UAB is 5-1 in conference action. Now this is a team quarterback Frank Harris and several other roadrunners have never beaten. We can't really look into all that, you know, but, you know, it's going to be a great test for us. You know, they're a great team. You know, they won um, this division, you know, three years in a row. Um, so, you know, they're, they're the big brothers to us, and uh, we'll go out there and uh, compete on Saturday. The intensity is always high because of, of a game week, but, you know, this one has a little extra oomph. Um, you know, they're the defending champs. They're, they're, they're the big dogs on the block. So, you know, we have to beat them to be great. Um, yeah, so just a little extra focus this week. It will also be senior day since it's the last home game of the regular season where seniors, including super seniors, will be recognized before kickoff at 2.30 p.m. In Carnivore, football will play at Houston Baptist University Saturday to close out the regular season. A win will clinch at least a share of the Southland Conference title for the Cardinals. Now, if ULW wins and Southeastern Louisiana loses to Nichols, the Cardinals will be outright champions. Kick is 2 p.m. Saturday in Houston. So two local teams definitely playing with a lot at stake. I was going to say a lot of different scenarios for both teams. So the easiest way to solve the problem is just go win. Just go win. Just yeah, win. that's usually what it comes down to, right? Yeah, win. That's all you need. All right. Just like everyone in the community, the San Antonio Food Bank has had to make some changes during the pandemic. 
but they've been able to get to help a lot of people. Coming up in the next half hour, we're going to be checking in with San Antonio Food Bank CEO and President Eric Cooper. The pandemic put a lot of families in difficult positions, forcing some people to have to reach out for help. And local nonprofits answered that call, including the San Antonio Food Bank. We're now joined by CEO and president of the San Antonio Food Bank, Eric Cooper. First off, good afternoon. Thanks for being with us. Um, the pandemic is now receding a little bit. Unfortunately, when you go to the grocery store, those numbers are going up, prices are going up. So where does the food bank stand right now a week away from Thanksgiving? Yeah, so it is challenging, right? This is going to go down as the most expensive Thanksgiving meal for all families across the United States. I mean, the cost of a turkey and all of the sides, all of the shorts have put more demand on these items. And when you think about the families we serve, that just means they're going home with less in their grocery cart. And to make up those differences, they're leaning on us at the San Antonio Food Bank. Overall, though, the numbers of people who are standing in line to get their food at the food bank is dwindling significantly. Am I right? That's, that's right. You know, many people know that at the height of the pandemic, we went from feeding 60,000 people a week to 120,000 people a week. Well, the good news is, is as we're starting to see clear of the pandemic, as the economy is strengthening, the line is shrinking. And so we're now down to about 90,000 people a week. It's taking a lot of food to meet that need and, and we're working to procure it. And San Antonio's continued to step up. And I think it's just timing the descent in support uh, so that we can continue to meet the demand. But I think we're super optimistic and excited for the families to have those opportunities to go back to work and, and get out of our line. <laughs> I guess you're one person that doesn't want to see people in line, and that's uh, at the food bank. What about volunteers? How are you set for volunteers? Obviously, at 90,000 still feeding, you still need a lot of help to get that food distributed. Well, again, we, we went from about 1,000 volunteers a week to the need of 2,000 volunteers a week to be able to execute. And, you know, many of those that were volunteering were some of those displaced workers. And as they got called back to work, they, they started to go back. And, um, you know, it, it is all about timing. Uh, we could sure use some help right now. Um, so if you have a little bit of free time, all ages, all abilities, always welcome in our kitchens, warehouse, farm, helping with deliveries and distribution. So please visit the website, register to volunteer. Lots of ways to get involved. So please, San Antonio, help out. So we definitely know the help wanted sign is hanging. Volunteers wanted out at the food bank. Um, I have a, a question having to do with first time users of the food bank. And I know a lot of that 120,000 were first time food bank clients. Are you seeing first timers still coming forward in yeah. light of food prices and the pandemic just dragging on? We are. I think, you know, it's difficult to ask for help. Um, and I think San Antonio, you know, we're proud. Um, and it's not until someone really runs out. And I, I met someone just this last week that, you know, they were a first timer. And it's like, you know, what's going on? And and they used all their resources. They they Their retirement, they pulled an equity loan. You know, and all of a sudden they're like, look, we're losing our house. We're losing everything. And, and they've just... Um, they've not wanted to lean on us and now in their disparity are coming. And I just wish that families would come sooner um, before you lose everything. Let us provide nourishment. Uh, we all go through seasons of trial. And if you had a job loss or, you know, you know, uh, there's been a lot that have had some significant medical bills related to COVID-19. And so uh, please, if you're in need, reach out to us at the food bank. We definitely can help you. We've done several stories on military families actually needing some help. Are you finding more or less of, of the military having to come in and get some help from the food bank these days? Yeah, staying about the same. I mean, again, that statistic of one in seven of the individuals we feed um, declare is either former or active military. Um, many more former than active. So 
but I think the awareness of the resource is making it a little easier for those um, in service to, to get a little bit of help there. Again, there's a, there's a lot of stigma and, and pride associated to folks not asking for help. But, um, you know, the, the food bank serves everyone in need, whether that's a senior or a child, uh, someone that's homeless or a veteran. We're going to make sure that they get the nourishment and San Antonio has continued to help us do that. And to which I am grateful and in the spirit of Thanksgiving, uh, I give thanks to those that have supported us all these years and definitely through the pandemic. We've got some turkeys to collect. So if you can help a little more, we could use it. But we're so grateful for everyone. Thank you so much for everything that you and the volunteers at the food bank do for our community. Um, uh, I'm going to just say it, you know, the turkey prices are higher. He's having to stretch his dollar further. So if you do have a little something extra, there's a good place for you to bank it right there at the food bank. It is hard to imagine where San Antonio and South Texas would be without the San Antonio Food Bank and without you, Eric Cooper. So once again, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a privilege. Thank you all. all Appreciate right. you. Happy holidays to you. And it's feeling a little bit more like the holidays yeah. outside. You <laughs> yeah. know, you kind of you feel that cool wind blowing through and temperatures fall and you think maybe I need to do a little Christmas shopping. It's very nice. Oh, my gosh. I Turkey I, shopping? I feel really behind with the turkey shopping and the general holiday really? shopping. Yeah. Done any Christmas shopping yet? No. Well, well can, for the pets in my family only. That's uh, it. Not for a human being. So Theo's looking pretty good. Yeah, he's in good shape. He's set up. <laughs> Theo the cat's in good shape. Uh, yes, feels a lot better out there today, especially if you're a fan of cooler weather. Look at this. Compared to this time yesterday, our temperatures for the most part are down about 20 degrees in some places. A little bit more than that. That puts us in the 50s and 60s across the board. Feeling great out there. Also feeling really comfortable with some lower humidity in place. As you saw on the live cam shot, we're starting to see more and more blue sky, but we've got a good amount of some high clouds around, especially south and west of San Antonio. So overall, I don't expect temperatures to climb much more this afternoon than where they are right now. So we'll have a hard time, most of us, getting out of the 60s. It'll be very comfortable despite a breeze that will hang on for several more hours. So feeling pretty cool and crisp today and again tomorrow. Good news for our Friday night football games coming up tomorrow evening. We've got another front in the forecast this weekend. It'll be Sunday afternoon and evening before it gets here. We're going to have enough time to feel more warm and humid Saturday into Sunday. Then that front will cool us down again by early next week. What happens though? As we get a little bit closer to Turkey Day, there's still some uncertainty with your Thanksgiving Day forecast, but it looks like it could include a chance of rain. I'll get you a sneak peek of your Thanksgiving forecast coming up in just a bit. David Ursula. Thank you, Katie. The man who fatally shot Ahmad Arbery testifying now, the 25 year old man's demeanor the day that he was shot and uh, struck him as suspicious. Travis McMichael on the stand explaining his thought process when he pulled up beside Arbery to ask him what he was doing in the neighborhood. Travis McMichael explaining in court that a series of burglaries in the neighborhood had raised residents concerns. That day there was an incident and McMichael says he wanted to ask Arbery about it. But when he told Arbery the police were on the way, Arbery began to run. McMichael is one of three white men on trial for the murder of Arbery. He and his father, as well as a neighbor, chased Arbery, leading to that deadly encounter. The funerals for Astroworld victims continue. Meanwhile, more lawsuits are coming. One attorney representing more than 100 clients says the cases come down to financial motives. I have one client that had you know, three or four levels of bodies stacked on top of her. There was no incentive whatsoever to cancel the concert that they'd already collected 50,000 tickets from. Them. There was no incentive to stop the live stream when Apple had already paid for the live stream uh, exclusivity. Busby's firm said it intends to file another lawsuit in the coming days with another 100 named plaintiffs. Still coming up. The Spurs break ground on their new facility. Larry Ramirez has more on that.
The numbers of Americans applying for unemployment benefits fell the seventh straight week, reaching a pandemic low. The Labor Department says U.S. jobless claims dipped by 1,000 last week, edging closer toward their pre-pandemic levels. The applications for unemployment aid have declined fairly steadily since reaching a peak back in January. The figures reflecting the labor market's continued recovery from last year's brief coronavirus recession. Outside with live camps, yeah, I think this is another reason why people like moving to San Antonio so bad because you got skies like that, a little cool, doesn't last real long, so winter's kind of short, or this little fall episode we're having is kind of short, but still, I mean, that's... It's true. Tim Gerber on the weekends always talks about how you know, I'll show the map and there'll be Ohio temperatures. <laughs> it's always so much colder. So much like, fun ah. to see that, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a great day today. Wind a little bit of a nuisance, but it will relax by this evening. And tomorrow is looking really, really nice. The aquifer today is down just one tenth of a foot and in your pollen count. Molds are moderate with a count of 950. Juniper low with a count of 20. Hopefully we'll get both of these to drop a bit into the day on Friday. I promised you a sneak peek of your Thanksgiving Day forecast. That is coming up next. So you know how wind and gas prices are related, right? No. If you're driving south and the wind's blowing like 25, oh, 30 miles an hour, it yes. pushes you along. If you're driving north, you're going against the wind, then you have to go harder. That right. makes sense. So you might True. save like, you know, that much. A smidge. A smidge. It adds up, right? <laughs> but hey. It adds up. Uh, do we have any night owls? Not me. <laughs> no, I'm. You're in the wrong group. Anyone? I'm Bueller. asleep at eight. <laughs> well, then, Ursula, I think you may miss the I partial lunar pretty eclipse. I'm sure I will. Tonight, I really like Mike Osterhage was saying it was, I think it was yesterday morning. He was like, you either have to get up very early <laughs> or stay up very late to see this partial lunar eclipse that will happen okay, technically so late tonight, very early, very early Friday. I know, what's the beaver? Uh, well, so this is a partial eclipse of the beaver moon, which is given the name beaver moon because this is the time of year where when beavers traditionally build their dams. Well, I thought you were going to, like, give us some beaver nuggets from Bucky's or something. <laughs> the beaver one. nuggets would be nice, but unfortunately I didn't bring <laughs> any with me today. Okay. So just kind of a, f a fun fact, sometimes moons have these names. I believe there's a, a buck moon at some point in the year because something with the, the antlers. Um, I'm not going to speak on it because I will probably be wrong. But anyway, so this is the time of year where <laughs> beavers in other parts of the country are building their dams. So that's why this is given the name Beaver Moon, here are your times for the eclipse overnight. Max eclipse is just after 3 a.m. and then it will start to wrap up before 5 a.m. So this is definitely a late night event. And the big question with these types of events is the cloud cover, sky conditions. And I do think we're still going to have a decent amount of high cloud cover around overnight through very early on Friday morning. Now, Highway 90 does look like it's going to be kind of the dividing point. If you're north of Highway 90, you could be a bit more on the clear side south of Highway 90. It does look like especially down to the southwest toward Catula up to Eagle Pass and Maverick County. Even more cloud cover, so a bit hit or miss with the cloud cover overnight for the eclipse, depending on where you live. But hopefully, if that is something you're interested in, you will luck out with the sky cover. Looking at our temperatures currently, just uh, just above 60 at the airport, 65 in Pleasanton, and 60 out in Del Rio, nice and cool. Also nice and breezy. Our sustained winds are about 15 to 25 miles per hour. That's where they'll stay through the middle of the afternoon, and then they'll start to relax just a bit later on this evening. And temperatures really shouldn't move much this afternoon from where they are now. So for most of us, that keeps us in the 60s. Some upper 50s for your highs today possible in the hill country. So nice and cool, also nice and dry. Our dew points are anywhere from the 30s to the teens across the area. That's a huge change from where those numbers were yesterday. Numbers will stay low dew point wise through Friday. Notice though by the weekend, 
they jump up to near 60, so it will start to feel a bit more humid as soon as the weekend. So this won't last long, but we've got another front Sunday that will drop humidity again by early next week. So some ups and downs in the forecast here as far as humidity and temperatures go over the next few days. I don't have a really impressive chance of rain in the forecast through the weekend or early next week, but looking ahead to our weather pattern this time next week, indications are that we could have a cutoff area of low pressure moving our direction from the west coast by late Wednesday into Thursday of next week. That would help us out with rain chances. So for now, it does appear rain could be possible. Some scattered rain as we get to Thursday next week. Temperatures with cloud cover potentially limited to the 60s. We will be tweaking that forecast, so keep checking back. But that's kind of a sneak peek for you. Temperatures today stuck in the 60s down to the 40s overnight. So cold start to the day tomorrow and then a beautiful Friday before humidity returns this weekend. Guys, the dreaded humidity. Yeah, sorry about that, Dave. It's all right. Messing up David's hair. There you go. What there is. Um, <laughs> speaking of messing up, they turned a little ground today for the Spurs in their new facility. Yeah, and you know, the Coyote was out there, of course. Oh, I mean, well, pfft. if it's a big event oh, for SS and E, you know the Coyote's gonna be there breaking a sweat, right? Yes, it was a special day for Spurs Sports and Entertainment. All smiles as they broke ground on their human performance campus. Plus, Brandeis and Canyon are one day closer to the state semis in high school volleyball. Coming up.